Hey everybody, it's Gauntletx, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing the Cons of Tarkir Arena Open Day 1 event. This is going to be a Cons of Tarkir Best of 1 sealed event, with the goal of getting 7 wins before 3 losses, and if we do that, we will qualify for the Arena Open Day 2, where we will be drafting Cons of Tarkir with potential cash prizes on the line. Without further ado, let's just bust open these packs and see what we get to play with today. Alright, well we've got a definite direction to go with these rares. We have two copies of the Karu Lich Lord, which can reanimate some stuff from your graveyard. It's only going to put them onto the battlefield for a turn, and then it's going to exile them. But being able to honor things for one final swing is still pretty solid, especially when they jump into the sky when they do so. We also have a Rakshasa Death Dealer here for a solid 2-drop in the Soltai Color Trio. And... That's kind of it for the really good stuff, and the reason that they're really good is that they're all uh, combined in the same color trio. The Master of Pearls is a very powerful card, but it is going to be very difficult to play it in the same deck that we're playing those Karu Lich Lords, because this is a card that doesn't really do anything unless you flip it face up with that morph cost, so you really need to have double white. So we would be playing a double white card in a deck that also has green-black cards, green-black-blue cards. Some difficult mana there to get all these rares into one deck, but who knows, maybe we'll have some really good fixing and we try to just jam everything together. So let's check out our colorless and the multicolored cards here to see how the fixing is looking in the sealed pool and see if there's anything else that is pushing us in a certain direction. I do really like Armament's Core. I think this is a very powerful card. It's 5 mana for 6 power and toughness worth of stats, and you can distribute it kind of wherever you want it, at least the final 2 power and toughness there, so really nice card. Uh, we've got that Bloodstained Mire, a Sandstep Citadel, Thornwood Falls, Windscarred Crag, Scoured Barons, and a couple Tranquil Coves. We've got some decent lands for fixing, but that's about it. There's two Teamer banners, but we don't really need red fixing in terms of our rares. We've got nothing crazy in the red anyway, which I guess is also a, a knock against the Windscarred Crag and the Bloodstained Mire, both of those being red mana fixing as well. Any other really premium multicolored cards here? No, I mean, Ride Down's good in draft because you can draft a really, really aggressive deck. Much harder to do in sealed. I guess Warden of the Eye is another okay card, but that would be a really difficult splash if we want to play Soltai as our main colors, which we probably do. Green, blue, black at the core of the deck, so unless we're like full-on five color, probably not running that. And this is just like a decent value play. So, pretty good if you're in Jeskai, if you're in blue, red, white, but a little harder to justify the splash, I'd say. Alright, so decent... Uh, decent multicolored and colorless stuff, but let's take a look at each color individually, see if there's anything absolutely insane that we're passing up on by going into Soul Tie. So our white looks pretty good. We've got that Master of Pearls. We've got some kill shots for defensive removal. I think with three kill shot, we probably don't play any Smite the Monstrous because it's a little more narrow, in my opinion. Obviously, the kill shot has the downside of not being able to shoot things that just sit there with a good ability and never declare an attack. But I don't think there's a whole ton of those. I feel like there's less creatures like that in the format than there are creatures with power 3 or less. There's plenty of those to go around that you might want to kill with kill shot. Yeah, I mean, the creatures here are solid, like a Battle Priest, a Kirin... The Master of Pearls is incredible, that's the biggest reason to be in white, and then having the kill shots is decent, so white looks like a perfectly solid color, just doesn't have, um, doesn't align with our multicolored rares, mainly. So for our blue, three River Wheel Aerialists, it's a six mana spell, but it is a beefy flyer, if we can get up to that mana cost. A couple Crippling Chills to slow things down. Jeskai Elder is a really solid 2-drop, and Treasure Cruise is pretty great if it's like the only Delve card you play in your deck, or if you have a bunch of fuel for it. Yeah, blue looks okay. No great uh, interaction, no great removal here, but I don't think blue really has good removal in this format in the first place. 
As for the black, we've got the Debilitating Injury, which plays a lot better than it looks because of all the three mana two twos off of morph cards like Sudisi's Pet here. So Debilitating Injury actually finds quite a few targets that it can kill. And it usually trades up in mana. You can spend two mana to kill a three mana card when you kill a morph. So I do like that injury a lot. But there's not a high quantity of black cards here, and that's the only really good one. So black would just be like a support color, maybe blue-green at the core if we go for our soul tie rares, play some morphs and stuff. Could be fine. Checking out the red now. Uh, red is our worst color by a lot. We've got one mediocre removal spell. A couple really bad creatures. A really just completely unplayable spell. Yeah, I mean, there's... What? Four mediocre filler cards. It's one card that can work in certain decks where you have a bunch of token production and you're super aggressive, but that's not what our sealed pool can do. Um, this might be another mediocre filler card. I think we do have a few power four greater creatures here with the Summit Prowler and the Double Canyon Lurkers. So Dragon Grip, I guess, is playable, but that leaves us with four basically unplayable red cards in a color that's already not that deep quantity-wise. And yeah, the quality is just not here. None of these are a big reason to play red, and there's only, what, five red spells total that we're even wanting to try out? And that would just be as filler for the most part. Red is the worst color. I don't think we're interested in trying that out. Green, on the other hand, looks very deep in terms of the quantity of spells. And obviously we get access to those soul tie rares if we play green, blue, and black. The parapets are fine for grinding out a long game. The teamer charger is a pretty decent body for the mana cost. The grizzly's fine with cards like savage punch that will buff it up and fight something. And I think the savage punch looks fine in this deck because we do have some top end creatures like tusked colossodon, pine walker, tower shell, looting mandrels, all that kind of stuff. The curve's a little better than it looks, because we've got that Archer as a morph and the Pine Walker as a morph. Green looks very, very reasonable here. Uh, it's got a couple cards I probably don't want to main deck, like just a life gain spell and just a literal naturalize. But overall, pretty big fan of the green, so thinking green, blue, splash black to get those powerful Sultai rares into the deck. Or, honestly, white was my favorite non-green color here. I think green's our best color, followed by white, then blue, then black, and then red. Yeah, pretty diminishing returns after green, white, and blue, although black does give us that debilitating injury. So yeah, green, white, just be completely unaligned to any of the clans. Only play one Bomb Rare, which is the Master of Pearls. But have a decent little aggressive curve here, especially when you consider, again, the Morph cards coming out on turn 3. This is a good mana curve, although the Parapets are defenders, so they're not really curving out aggressively. The Erases aren't playable. They're not that good at getting a wide board state for Rush of Battle, and I don't want to play Double Smite in a deck that has 3 kill shot. I don't want to play Naturalize, don't want to play Feed the Clan. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cuts. So we'd have to get two more cards in here. So we need some colorless or multicolored. There's no playable colorless cards. And well, this is an allied color pair. So there are no cards in the entire set that are just green and white. So if we went in this direction, it would probably be Abzan, I suppose. Green, white, black. We splash in the armament core. The Chief of the Edge, the Rakshasa Death Dealer, maybe a debilitating injury as well. Yeah, I like taking a look at probably Abzan versus Sultai then. Yeah, I like all these more aggressive two drops for this build, most likely. So take a peek back at that black if we're splashing in here. We get to play the Debilitating Injury, then. Saddlebrood, I think, is also a fine splash. Like, you really need to get that Raid Trigger for it to be worth the cost, but a 4-mana four 4-5 four, is just beefy in the set. Obviously, if you shoot yourself in the face, it's not a great deal, but... 
I also like the scavengers, big delve flyers. Got good fixing. Not a ton of it, but having a scoured barons and a sandstep citadel is nice. Is there any other fixing for this trio? No. Not unless we also want to splash in double Lich Lord, which is maybe fine when I have three blue sources without playing a single island. Well, maybe we do actually get to play all of our rares this way. If we play white as a core color of the deck and blue just as a splash, we only really need... Oop. Almost spilled my drink. Only really need three or four blue sources to splash in just a single blue symbol on a six mana spell like that. Um, and having white be one of the core colors of the deck means we'll have enough white sources that we can actually hit double white on flipping up Master of Pearls. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to look at Abzan and then just look at Soltai, but I feel like shoving the two together is actually pretty real here, pretty legitimate. So we're every color except red, basically. So we can take another look through every non-red color and see if there's anything that looks great that we're missing out on. Basically, everything up here is either mediocre or red. So nothing there. Uh, could play Sidisi's Pet. It's another three colorless mana 2-2. Two -two, so no matter what's going on with our mana, we've got something to play there. Don't love Raiders spoilers. I don't think our warrior count's incredible. Seven is not terrible. But this is a little bit of a win more card, right? Like you already need to be in a good enough position that you're consistently dealing damage to your opponent. Otherwise, you've spent four mana for pretty much nothing. If you're in a position where either you can't attack favorably or you just don't have a warrior on board then you're spending four mana. You are getting plus one plus zero to the whole board, but that is a very, very small amount of impact for that high of a mana cost. I don't love the idea of the Raiders spoils. Dutiful Return might be fine. This should be a glacially slow sealed format compared to what we've been used to lately with a lot of really good aggressive one-two mana cards and stuff. So just a big late game graveyard recursion value play like this could be fine. So I'll slap it in for now. Um, but the little cheap creatures here, probably not stuff that's super worth a splash. Uh, so Treasure Cruise, very similar to the Dutiful Return, where it's going to be a late game play for pretty good value. Actually very, very, very similar to the Dutiful Return. This could be better in circum certain circumstances where our graveyard's full enough that we delve a whole ton. But if we're casting this for four mana or more, Dutiful Return is probably almost always better that late in the game because it's a guaranteed, like, our two best creatures go back to our hand. Our two best creatures that have died versus Treasure Cruise, three cards is on average going to be 1.5 lands and then, uh, like, 1.5 non-land cards. So it could be, like, two lands and one non-land, in which case Dutiful Return was better. Or it could be two non-lands and one land, in which case Dutiful Return was probably still at least comparable, picking up our two best creatures from Grave, so. And the biggest thing against the Treasure Cruise here, the biggest knock against it, is that it would be a third blue spell to make that blue splash a little more difficult to where we want to play more than maybe four blue sources. And our mana base is good, but I don't want to stretch it that thin to try to get like five blue sources and seven white sources and eight green sources and stuff like that. That's going to be a little difficult to do. So, yeah, unless there's like a really, really powerful blue spell that only requires a single blue mana, I don't think we're splashing anything else in out of that color. So I think we're just going to keep that to exclusively the Lich Lords as top end finishers. Uh, we've got solid removal without the smites. I don't think our board state's going to be massively wide for the rush of battle. And our race is very, very narrow. I think these are a collection of our best spells. So let's go ahead and look through here and cut the nine weakest ones. Or cut the ones that are less focused on a specific game plan or something like that. I think that seems fine. Yeah, Abzan Splash Blue it is. 
Liking the deck idea. I guess looking at the deck like this, pulling those Lich Lords out to the side, we do really have to ask ourselves how valuable really are the Lich Lords to splash in? Because in theory, if we don't have the creatures in Graveyard, then this is a 6 mana 4-4 four four that's hard to cast. If we do have the creatures in Graveyard, it's picking up a random one we actually don't get to choose. So it might just pick, pick up one that's too small to really impact the game. It also works pretty miserably with Delve. There's some issues with the Lich Lord. It's not just like a straight up bomb. Just an okay rare, actually. Yeah. Maybe just looking at this with some rose tinted glasses here. Just seeing it being a cool multicolored card, but it's overcosted for its power and toughness by quite a bit, so you need to get a lot of mileage out of that ability. That ability doesn't even trigger until your next upkeep. Once it does, it's pulling something back at random and taxing you three mana to do it. Only works a couple times before your cards are just all exiled, and obviously we'd have to probably just cut every Delve card in the deck. Cut the Scavengers and the Mandrels. That's not the biggest Nombo ever, because we don't have any like really good Delve cards that we have to cut. But maybe, maybe I'm giving this card too much credit, actually. So looking at the stats right now, this card is actually performing quite Poorly in Premier Drafts, it's at 48.8% win rate, which is well below average for 17 lands users at around 54, 55%. That is really bad in Premier Draft, but I'm hoping the difference in Sealed is big enough that this actually gets some mileage in this slower, grindier format that can get into some board stalls and we can pull some things out of Grave and try to finish our opponent off with them. I guess it works really poorly with the dutiful return as well. Yeah. I mean, three of our five mana sources here are like just helping us get blue mana. So, honestly, I don't even think our mana base is really any better not splashing it. If I, if I cut the island, then we have essentially the same mana base whether or not we splash it. Right, where I, I trade these two Tranquil Coves for two more planes. I trade this Thornwood Falls for another forest. So I guess there's not a massive cost to trying to splash it in, but there is the cost of that one island. Because with two, two copies of it, I don't think I want to play only three blue sources. I don't know, it's probably still better than like Colossodon and maybe the Delve Dorks, although maybe just playing a single like Scavenger Flyer is just a better way to end the game. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to start with it in the deck. We're going to see how it performs for us, and if it looks just miserable, and it plays just miserable, then we can swap it out for uh, for just two like Soul Tie Scavengers, two just Delve Flyers as finishers in the deck. Uh, I accidentally cut some lands. This is 18 lands, though. That's where we want to be for sealed, for sure, in this set. Especially with big six drops, five drops, morphs that flip on five, stuff like that. All right. Much ado about nothing there. We did end up keeping the Lich Lords in for now, but I really want to see... I want to play around with them and see how they actually perform. I think we want to cut the more aggressive removal spells like Awaken the Bear and Savage Punch and just keep the defensive ones like the Kill Shots in the slower deck. The Bear Punch is just um, a little narrow and the Awaken the Bear I just don't think is going to pop off too much with our mana curve. Cut some Dirtly Morphs here I think. Although we still want a good amount of three drops. Which of these is the best? And probably the archer, just for beef. Anything at four mana that looks kind of bad. Uh, we don't have a ton of plus and plus one counter synergies to go alongside the long shot squad or the Abzan Battle Priest. But I mean, Battle Priest into Armament Core is like the dream team right there. If we ever accomplish that, that'll be insane. And Lifelike is just a really good. 
ability to get. If we just outlast this once and start beating in, that's also fine. And I think Longshot Squad's probably a little more filler. Meandering Tower Shell. This is another one I'm not so sure about it. It's astronomically slow. So a 5 mana 5-9 five, with Island Walk. Whenever it attacks, you exile it. Then on the next combat step, it hits the battlefield and hits your opponent. So... When you attack with this card, it can't block the turn that you attack with it like usual, but then that next turn, it's still not blocking because it's still tapped and now it's finally tried to deal damage to your opponent. Then three turns after you declared the attack, it's finally back on your board untapped. This is... Mm, I mean, unless you just want to hold this up as a gigantic defender or something, that's actually probably just bad so we can just keep our curve actually actually kind of aggressive here although firehoof cavalry without a red source is meaningless it's just bad so we definitely cut that uh students a little filler i think all the other two drops look pretty great though yeah i mean we're at 21 creatures right now if i drop say the cavalry for sure um and then we go for the tower shell Two of these cards come back in. You know, I mean, Jeskai Student just looks really bad here because we have three of our non-creature spells or cards that we're only casting on blocks. I mean, Prowess on blocks is actually maybe reasonable. I can imagine a situation where our opponent just attacks with two two twos, like a two mana two two and their three mana two two morph, and then we kill shot one of them and then Prowess block the other one as a two four. Okay, that's actually that's actually impressed me. That narrow position maybe makes up for the two mana one three the rest of the time. Yeah, I think I just put one of the morphs back in for mana curve purposes because that fills out the three drop and five drop slot, which is pretty cute. Pretty acceptable to me. Let's throw. Let's throw the Sage Eye in there, get some more flying to maybe finish things off with. And this will be the deck 18 lands. We just want to make sure that we've got the correct colors here. Primarily white, green, splashing black and blue. More black than blue in the deck for sure. We want a good chunk of black sources because we have some two drops in black that would be really nice to cast on turn two. And we have a lot more black spells than blue spells. We actually might have more black than green. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight green spells. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight black spells. We have equal black and green. Okay. And white is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A little more white than anything else. Then we got black, green, and then last and certainly least is blue. So we are at four, five, six, seven, eight white sources. Seems pretty reasonable for a primary color. Twelve white cards, eight white sources. Seems fine to me. Oh, where you stand a normal deck, I think. Maybe like nine white sources. If you're just a two-color deck, you definitely can do that. Go nine, nine, eight split with 12 of your main color. But eight is still pretty reasonable. As for green, we're on five, six, seven green sources. Black, we have four, five, six. Huh. So a little bit less black than green right now, but they're even in terms of how many cards of each color we have. And three of the green cards can be morphed for colorless. Which actually makes me feel black might be more important than green. So for cards that 100% need green mana, we have one, two, three, four, five. And for cards that 100% need black mana, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and two cards that could really use it with a couple Mardu Hate Blades. Yeah, I think black should be 7 and green should be 6, weirdly. So here's 4, 5, 6 green, and then 5, 6, 7 black. And then finally blue, we only have 3 right now. But the only way to get another blue source into the deck is to drop a black, a green, or a white here. 
I think because we don't need the blue mana till turn six for our only two blue cards in the deck, it's probably fine to just run the three blue sources. It's pretty high likelihood of having it turn six, because that late into the game will have drawn 13 of our cards, seven from the opener and six for the future turns, 12 or 13 of our cards, depending on if we were on the play or on the draw. Looking for one out of three that are in the deck. Yeah, I think we can go to make our main colors really consistent. Go for just those blue colors on the dual lands. And now we have no off color sources for just the pure Abzan stuff in the deck. Yeah, I think I'll wrap up the mana base like that and call it a deck here. All right, here we have a look at the completed deck list for today. We're on an Abzan mid-range grind fest with a blue splash for a couple of Karu Lich Lords. So I don't know how well these are going to play. They've got a pretty bad win rate in Premier Draft, but I think that Sealed is hopefully going to be slow enough and have enough board stalls that being able to just recur some flying threats a couple times in a row can hopefully close some games out for us. But we'll see if they underperform severely, we can cut them for a couple on-color delve flyers. But the splash is nearly free here because we have multiple blue dual lands. So we get to put three blue sources in this deck without cutting down on any of our main three colors. So we're going to try out the Lich Lords at the start. If they play terribly, then we'll swap them out for something else. But that is probably the coolest thing going on in the deck. Other than that, it's just a bunch of solid abs and stuff. Decent removal with a few kill shots and a debilitating injury. A pretty great curve for a sealed deck that includes some other powerful on-color rares. A Master of Pearls we can try to flip up on turn 5 to buff our whole board, which is pretty good when you have a consistent curve of creatures like this. As well as a Rakshasa Death Dealer that's kind of just a standalone threat. Gets whatever ability you need for that 2 mana to uh to keep it around so pretty solid stuff here very excited to see how it does so without further ado let's head into the gameplay here we are on the play for game one with arguably our most important colors i think black is slightly more important than green in this deck but i think that green is still definitely one of the primary three colors so starting with white green is solid another kill shot no benefit from our great mana curve this game, sadly. We're not going to start till turn three. And now we draw the two drop. Fashionably late, as always. Always a bummer to hit those two mana cards turn three. Playing against a blue-black deck here. Probably Soul Tie as well. Yep, there's the red-green duel. They could just be playing all colors. Miss a land drop here. We are on an 18 land deck because of the slower format and 6 mana finishers being in this deck. Send in the Alpine Grizzly. Cool. Well, can only cast one spell this turn no matter what, whether it's a 2 drop or a 3 drop, so I could just morph this. Yeah, I actually think it might be pretty valuable to morph this, because then if they do block it with, like, an Embodiment of Spring, a 0-3, we can kill it out of nowhere. But they may be sacrificing this to get their land next turn anyway. Yeah, if they just hold 4 mana up, they are very likely sacrificing the Embodiment to pick up a land. But at least they don't stop any damage this turn. Oh, that's fine. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right, they're just going to sack it, so might as well stop four instead of two. Um, let's maximize damage output here. I actually think I reveal the Lich Lord. Because it's not likely to matter to this game. But them knowing what one of our morphs could be could really matter. Yeah, they're already down to 11 here. I actually think I go for Harrier over Pine Walker. Because if we hit a fifth land, we can just cast the Pine Walker now. That's the full five color from our opponent. They're just going to drop a 5-5. Five, five. Oh, God. All right. Well, these Lich Lords are looking horrible. This game. 
So kill a 4-2, take 5. We put them down to 6. I'm sacking a I'm sacking a grizzly to hit them for five. Is that worth it at this point in the game? I think it is. Okay. Sack a team recharger to deal six is even better. So if they block the wrong morph, they're dead? It's a gamble here. But they have to block the grizzly on one morph. And if they block the wrong one, they're dead. So here we go. Alright, they blocked the right morph. I can still trade here. But we didn't get the lethal. They're down to three. They die in... Three hits from the flyer. If we can find a black and a blue source, we can kill them by reanimating anything from the grave. So there's that as well. And there's the blue source. Got seven black sources in the deck. Oof. Savage punch. Well, I've got time. I can kill shot both of their current threats next turn. So hoping they don't have much other gas to roll on into us here. Ooh. Double spell? Double weave of fate. Draw four. Okay. Well, there's some more action for them. Highly doubt they just hit four lands. It's very unlikely. Oh my god, that's actually triple weave fate? Okay. Hello, forest three before black source number one. You are highly statistically improbable. Appreciate that. There we go. So if they have the removal for the Lich Lord, we go to two and they go back up to seven. Let's think. I mean, they know I'm holding something up if I do this, if I do hold up the kill shot. Because they know I have the Lich Lord in hand. Oh. I mean, if they have the removal for the Lich Lord, then even if I... Kill shot the Abzan guide this turn, we've got... We're not winning, right? Because we still take four and go to six. Then we cast the Lich Lord next turn and get it killed. Take another four and go to two. The odds of them not just like, if they have the removal spell, playing the removal spell and another creature here are so astronomically low, so... The only way that holding up the kill shot is better is if they have a removal spell and no creatures out of those six cards. Alright. You got me. Well, bad showing from the Lich Lords there. I know I don't even think it was their fault, really. They would have been just as bad draws as literally any other black spell. Right, because that, it's not that we couldn't hit our blue source, it's because we didn't have the black source. We have seven black sources and five green. Yeah, seven black sources and six green. We still found triple green before one black. We had the blue source. But I guess, I mean, we didn't have the blue source on time either. I don't know. I mean, I think we... We hit a little better mana they were actually very very real win conditions that game roll it back well this is a laughable mana base we have triumphs and duels all over the place this is not the kind of hand we're gonna keep 
The opening hands are definitely very disappointing mana-wise. But we keep this one and ditch the Lich Lord. We have like six non-basics in this deck. We just don't draw them. There's the turn two Valley Dasher from our opponent. There's a non-basic. But I already ditched one of my two blue spells here. There's a morph from our opponent. Morph of our own. Without a trick, the Alabaster Kieran will block and kill the Valley Dasher. Well, we know what our uh, turn five play is. Armament core is going to be spicy. I feel like if they had a decent trick, they probably would have attacked last turn with that 2-2 as well. So I think I will declare the block with the Kirin when they're forced to attack with the Valley Dasher. Flip up the Mystic of the Hidden Way. Well... Now they may actually have a trick in hand, because that would be a very good use of 3 mana, flipping that up into an unblockable threat when we're down to 15. Alright, free kill's a free kill. And time for a great turn. Just gotta outrace a 3-2 unblockable and we're good. An armament core can very much do that. Okay, our board state already outraces perfectly well. They're down to 14. Bloodfire Mentor. 0-5? Okay. I'd be very surprised to see them not attack here. There it is. And that is a good draw. Because now I can cast the Chief and still threaten to Death Touch up the Hate Blade. So they have to block the Morph here. Um, I guess it doesn't matter because the Morph isn't really going to combat trick away their creature or anything. Anyway. But I guess if they have one of the red fight spells that do exist in this format, we can give Death Touch in response. If they have a swift kick, plus one plus oh, fight a creature you don't control. Try to have their Blood Fire Mentor fight our Hate Blade. We can make sure it's still a trade. I gotta say this is uh, two games in a row now that are points against the Lich Lord. Not because it wouldn't have been good if it resolved in either of these games, but here we had to basically put it on bottom with the way that we drew, and it also made our first opening seven card hand worse. Um, and then game one, game one was straight up just because we didn't have the mana to cast it. Again, there weren't any issues really with like if it resolved it being good. Outside of it dying before it does anything, if we don't make it to our next upkeep. The ability is like theoretically good. It's just getting the mana there, getting it to stay on board for a whole turn that has been difficult. But yeah, two games in a row. Points against the Lich Lord. Splash. I mean, our our Delve creatures are just so much more consistent to cast. They just need one specific color of mana, and that is it. 
I am really feeling like that is probably the way to go. Right, because like game one, if instead of two Lich Lords, I had two Soltai Scavengers for just big flyers, I think we would have just won while they were doing Weave Fate Dirtles. I don't even know the math on this. I just very confident we attack all. Okay, so that looks like a really good board state for us. So I guess the math is golden. Master of Pearls is a broken card there. There's a Weave Fate for our opponent. They could play one land here, but one mana is not going to stop all this. So Embodiment of Spring it is, and we will be one and one as we head into game three of this event. I will be swapping out those Lich Lords for a couple Sultai Scavengers between games now. That's pretty perfect mana here. We will keep, and our opponent's on the play, which should up the quality of Killshot a little bit. Killshot had been a little awkward game one. They panned out fine near the end of it, but just sitting in our hand dead for quite a while. Debilitating injury on the hate blade. R.I.P., my friend. R.I.P. Grim Heart Specs. It's a very good card. Whenever another non token they control dies, they draw a card. So it doesn't draw a card itself. So I will kill shot it if they send it in. Stop the card draw engine from outvaluing us throughout this game. There's a Mardu War Shrieker, a really good card. It's going to be their 3-3 three, three and a 2-drop here, and the 2-drop is a Mardu Skull Hunter. It's going to rip a land out of this hand. Debilitating Injury is the draw. I could injury the Skull Hunter, but theoretically, if I can get a flip up here, could get a free kill on the Skull Hunter instead of spending a card. Although, we'll see if they have additional removal to go with their injury. Sending the team down to 15 it is. Hortling Outburst. Bunch of 1-1s one here, alright. That's a wide board. It is going to be hard to block all that, especially if our Sagu Archer dies. Because then we only have a 1-1 one -one to follow up with, which obviously... Um, just trades into a 1-1. One -one. Even though it can get Death Touch, it just trades into Goblins, which is really bad. We could have like the bring low here to do three to the archer. Throw two spells into it. Ugh, murderous cut. All right, at least we got to block with it before it got removal spelled. Turn would have been even worse for us if they just did that main phase one. Not that the turn was great, but here we are. Now we got to injury the skull hunter, drop a grizzly to trade into the war shrieker, take three and outburst is going to get us here. With that wide board of creatures. Just can't block it all. Rakshasa's Secret. I mean, we were down to two cards in hand, so it looks monstrous, but it... Honestly, just insult to injury. These cards don't really help us against three 1-1s. One, one for wanting a goblin token with a kill shot is horrible, and one for wanting a goblin token with a hate blade is horrible. So we were going to have to draw something great either way. Dutiful Return is not that. It's fine. But not great. We need to pick up a Hate Blade so we can just immediately trade into something here. But then... 
I guess anything with at least two toughness. I feel like I take the archer. Because if I need a three mana card with two toughness, I can still play it as a three mana card with two toughness, but I also have the ability to play it as a two five in case they play a bigger threat. Wow, they've just drawn four lands all game. All gas, no breaks. When I mean, we've only drawn five. There's only one line here that leaves us temporarily alive, in theory. But we know they don't have any more lands in hand, so they still have another non-land right there. And if it's removal, we're dead. Oh. My god. Post commentary gauntlet here now, as after that last game, I was fairly certain there was no chance we'd make it to a 7 win run, so I wanted to save my energy for the next recording, as that would be the one that'd get uploaded to YouTube if it was more interesting. Obviously, that backfired because we did end up getting some pretty wild games out of this run, so this is going to be the run that's edited and uploaded to YouTube. So, with that mid video intro out of the way, let's talk about some of these games of magic that we still have in this sealed run. So here we're against a Soul Tide deck that is splashing white with this Blossoming Sands, or potentially an Abzan deck splashing blue, but with double island from our opponent. Doesn't look super likely that's the splash. So pretty slow hand here, we just go for the kill shot on their morph, but they flip it up and it is the Regenerator, which is pretty nasty. The Thornwood falls from our opponent for some life gain. And High Sentinels of Arishin. So this was the point that I was pretty sure. Alright, the run's completely over. Now we're just going through the motions for value. But I figure, alright, let's play some flyers here. That is going to make it so we have enough power and toughness on our side of the board that at least the High Sentinels can't attack in. For those who don't know, that is a... A flyer with an activated ability that for 4 mana lets them put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a different creature they control. And when they do, they're also going to buff the High Sentinels, because it gets plus 1 plus 1 for every other creature with a counter on it. So, basically it's impossible for us to attack into that thing, and we also don't have particularly good blocks set up, so... We just need to keep casting a bunch of flyers to make sure that thing does not damage us anytime soon. But if we can't deal with that at some point pretty quickly here, then we're going to have some big issues. As that will completely take over the game, even if they don't play any more creatures. Honestly, they could just keep putting a counter on their board every single turn and buffing things up. So, was looking over our opponent's mana base there a bit. It is full four color, it looks like. Multiple duels on board, a dual milled in the graveyard. Now for turn number seven, we've got the Armament Core to buff up one of our Scavengers. I don't think we have any great lines with this thing here, trying to figure out where to put the counters to attack into the High Sentinels, as you can see with me looking around here. I'm like, all right, 4-5 Kirin into the High Sentinels is bad. 5-5 five, five Scavenger into the High Sentinels can get one attack in, so I guess we do that. And that is what we do go for. And there's a nice little poke sound effect. And now they start jamming some plus and plus one counters out. So one attack is all we can really get off of this scavenger, because now they're threatening to use the sentinels to put a plus one plus one counter on the warden. And that would make the high sentinels a 5-6 on blocks. So we got the five damage in that we could. Hit another land. Drop the Charger face down, since a 3-1 body doesn't really matter anyway. Might as well threaten to flip into something spooky, and potentially get some value out of getting Trample on a future turn. Our opponent is way in the lead card advantage-wise. Their Sultai Soothsayer managed to hit the board and draw them another card, 
The High Sentinels has hit the board as a really scary threat and allowed them to just keep using its activated ability a couple a couple times here to where they don't have to cast any spells. So it's like seven cards in hand to one. So we are just wildly behind right now in terms of card advantage, but not astronomically behind on board. All we need is one removal spell to clear out the Sentinels, and we're jamming in for a lot. And while we didn't find a removal spell, we found our Master of Pearls, which flips up into giving our whole board plus two, plus two. So while we aren't going to be able to kill all of their creatures profitably, we can still attack pretty wide and hit our opponent for a lot of damage here on the following turn. So Master of Pearls is still a pretty good draw. Now I'm double checking the High Sentinel's printed card. Because I was trying to see, I'm like, how is that a 6-7 right now? It's because it's a 3-4 getting plus 2, plus 2 because they have two other creatures with counters on it. And it has a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it itself now. So pretty complex figuring out the power and toughness of the High Sentinels. But here's our just jam. Just send in the team. Just flunge it all. Just go for that flip here, and luckily we actually hit the ninth land, so I can flip up the Master of Pearls and cast the Saddle Brute in the same turn to keep that pressure on, make it less likely my opponent has some removal spells to dig out of this one, if we can get them down enough here and keep a wide board state, we might be able to just kill them in two attacks despite their level of card advantage. And there's that big buff. This is 15 damage on board, 6 plus 4 plus 5, putting them to 13. It's interesting because I like... It's interesting because I played these games earlier today, and they're still kind of fresh to me. <laughs> I'm like, I don't remember exactly what happens here. It's kind of interesting. So there's the Saddle Brute. They've got two creatures on board to a million. They're only out here as a board wipe. And the hostilities to destroy all creatures or doom blast to destroy all but one. Those are both rares. And there's the concession from our opponent. They just do not find the board wipe or just don't have a board wipe in their sealed pool. So that is a second victory for us. We are now two and two heading into game number five. This is a very solid opening hand. It's a little bit light on plays, a little bit late game oriented with the charger into the dutiful return. <laughs> you could see me thinking when I just jiggle a land for like 10 seconds. I'm like, eh. That was me deciding to debilitating injury their seeker the way immediately because the prowess trigger on that thing is super nasty. So here we go for a block on their morph, and they have the feat of resistance to put a plus one plus one counter on it, but disgustingly, our morph card is the free flip, so we can still just take the trade there. So a two for two trade instead of a two for one like they were hoping for. So being able to flip up that teamer charger for free was actually incredible against their combat trick. Our opponent drops an ancestor and just starts uh, getting counters on the board. We're like, all right, let's beat down. I've got the dutiful return against the board wipe or anything. So we're safe to just jam everything onto the board and keep beating down. And that is absolutely what I do here. Trying to decide if I wanted to morph that or hard cast it. We go for the hard cast there. Because it's not really a combat trick off the morph that crazily. They do have the Dune Blast which would be completely backbreaking in most other games, but because we have the dutiful return in hand, we still have some more threats to get on this board. And our opponent doesn't have anything crazy for follow-up creatures. This death-touching hate blade obviously is going to trade into one of our threats straight up. But recasting our flyer here is going to be really nice, and we've got enough cards in grave since they dune blasted us to just dump the entire hand and re-establish a board that is much in our favor, attacking for half their life total in the sky, so they're dead in two swings in the sky alone. So we send in the Flyers and the Jeskai student, because trading a 1-3 into a 1-1 one, one Death Touch, not a bad deal. It'll clear a path for our 5-5, five, five, which is what our face down is here. And there's the concession from our opponent. They just couldn't deal with the Flyers, and we get right past the Dune Blast, 
for three and two now, heading into game number six. And this is a pretty great opening hand. It's got some pretty severe mana issues. Obviously, we want to draw Black Swords pretty badly. But I believe we have seven in this deck, so we can probably hit one soon-ish. And we don't need need a Black Source till turn four. We can just morph a card and then drop a Kieran on turn four. I guess we don't need the Black Source till turn five, because we could just play Kieran instead of Saddle Brute on turn four. So here I decide, I think, to go for the Saddle Brute here to get some threats on the ground, because our turn five play to be mana efficient is going to be our two mana removal spell and a three mana morph. So we're going to removal spell the regenerator so we can actually get attacks in on the ground. And then that's going to make a Saddle Brute attack just a lot more damage than an Alabaster Kieran attack. Especially if we get to attack with the Saddle Brute twice and hit them twice, which is a possibility as well. So maximizing our damage output there, going for the Saddle Brute before the Kieran, since we know we're clearing out a ground creature that turn anyway. So we've got the Master of Pearls face down. We can flip up for a bunch of extra damage, but they held all their mana up, so didn't want to run into anything crazy here. So I was like, let's just send in the one creature and see what happens. They throttle the 4-5. That's fine. We've got the mana to drop the Hate Blade and the Kirin, get a wide board state, and now that they're tapped out, send in for that Master of Pearls flip, which, as we saw a couple games ago, is absolutely disgusting. And here is no difference. Our master trades into their 4-4 and everything else eats their creature or just hits them in the face for a bunch. And the top deck dutiful return is incredible, being able to put the master back in our hand so we can just morph it and flip it up for 8 mana and buff the whole board later in the game. But for now, we've got plenty of threats, so we're just going to keep jamming them out. Drop another morph. So here I was really scared of that rare that flips face up and returns all tapped creatures to their owner's hands. So I'm playing around that here. It flips into a 5-6 flyer and bounces all tapped creatures. So that's why you see me attack like this, where I don't send in the Kirin because it would just die to the 5-6 flyer, and I don't send in all three, because then we'd bounce all three, and then I immediately look at the face down, and it's just the first striker. It's just the first striker. They were super dead either way, but I've been got really badly by that flip card that bounces all tapped creatures before, so I just really didn't want to do that here. So this hand looks pretty good. Obviously not having the green source for Death Dealer is pretty disappointing, but the spells in it are powerful, and we top deck the forest anyway, because we never didn't have it. So Rakshasa Death Dealer, that's a free attack into their Death Toucher. We can just regenerate the Death Dealer if they block, and they do. So we get that in immediately, and that's really solid value for us, because we didn't have a turn 3 play anyway. Now turn 4, I was expecting Alias to not block here, because now they definitely know that we could just regenerate the death dealer but she goes for the block anyway so i imagine that she's just trying to tax our mana and make sure that we're not just jamming down more and more and more creatures and by soaking up the regenerate mana that does mean that alias does get to kill the death dealer because we're tapped out of the regenerate so alias kills our death dealer with the arc trail clears that off the board but this hand just keeps getting better. We have more threats. We got to play a Morph and a 3-2 in the same turn. Now we get to drop a Saddle Brute without taking any damage. We just keep hitting action here. We already got a 3-for-1 off of our Death Dealer. It cleared out two of Alias's early creatures and one of our removal spells. So we're just so far ahead now. And now we're just beefing the board with the Armament Core. And that just leads to the concession from Alias. And we have turned our one and two run into five and two now heading into game number eight with some wild games we fought our way through a high sentinels we fought our way through a doom blast the deck has been firing on all cylinders after that so turn two chief of the edge from this mardu opponent we start with the jeskai student and this game was interesting. This game, I really don't know if I played this out right. 
uh, and that may have negatively affected the outcome. We'll we'll see. So we start with a Jeskai student, and I just hold up the kill shot because I imagine they probably attack with the chief in the morph, but they choose not to. They play around us going for the kill shot prowess trick, which is pretty smart. And then I choose to just do it again because I'm like, well, now they have three creatures out. I imagine they're definitely attacking at this point. But again, it's like, because they didn't attack at all, that was three mana spent on nothing turn three when I had several other options. And now we'll see how the, the kill shot Jeskai student prowess works out for us. And it doesn't work out terribly. The student doesn't die in the fight or anything, so just one for one kill something with a kill shot. It works out fine, so I don't know if that whole Jeskai student prowess kill shot play was worth it, because it taxed a lot of our mana to try to get there. So now I do hit the Black Source for the Death Dealer, so I go for the Death Dealer plus the Grizzly, hoping they don't have instant removal for the Death Dealer. Our regeneration is down for now. And then Rakshasa's Secret's pretty gross from our opponent. I decide, decide to discard the uh, Flyer and the Kill Shot, because that makes Scavenger super cheap, so anything we draw is castable here. But then we just draw a Plains. So... We just pass turn from there to hold up the regeneration for the Death Dealer, and that's where I start feeling really awkward for my keep of Scavenger over the other cards, because it's like, well, if I wanted to keep another threat, I probably should have kept the Kirin, because I could cast the Kirin and hold up their regeneration if I drew any land, and I did draw land, so it would have played better to hold on to the Kirin instead of the Scavenger. But then we top decked the Swamp anyway, so we get to cast the Scavenger the next turn and still hold up Regeneration, which is good. Plus, we wanted to make sure to pay for some of the Delve for the Scavenger to keep a creature in our grave in case we top deck a Dutiful return later. So that's why... Another reason why I paid for that, obviously. Um, I also wanted to hold up a couple mana for the Regeneration, and holding up three mana is no different from holding up two mana, so we might as well not exile that many cards. So opponents just dropping flyers and we're just in a big old top deck war here, staring at each other, but our death dealer is at least sticking around no matter what. So I'm making some weird attacks with the death dealer. The reason is I'm playing around them having instant speed removal like a kill shot or something, because arena keeps holding for them. So I don't want to end up attacking in, double buffing the death dealer to make it a 6-6 six -six, and then them responding by killing it with removal. So that's why I haven't been being super aggressive with the Death Dealer, where they did block with a Sage Eye Harrier earlier, and that basically confirmed to me that they have instant speed removal in hand, because I don't think they would block with that if I could just double buff the Death Dealer and eat their 2-5 without losing a creature. So the fact that they did block with it is the reason why I chose not to double buff. If they didn't block with the Harrier, then I would not be so certain that they have some kind of removal in their hand and i might be getting a little more aggressive with the death dealer although i still think i'd be holding up regeneration at all times so we top deck dutiful return which is spectacular but right now we're only picking up one creature with it and i don't really want to go for like massive chump attacks right now so i'm just hanging out with it we've got a kill shot as well if they do something super nasty and then we top deck the card that has been the MVP for the last several games, that Master of Pearls. And I'm like, all right, so we slam down a Master of Pearls and just attack with everybody next turn, dropping out the planes. So if something weird happens, we can flip the Master of Pearls during their turn. Like if they play a forest into a death frenzy to minus two, minus two, everybody. And here we are for the ultimate math is for blockers moment plunge it in and see what happens that's how you play with master of pearls card is nuts so here's a big old block and here's a big old buff from that master of pearls see the time where our opponent's just reading that and being like what on earth the card is busted so here, I only have one black source up because of the auto-tapper. I think I should have manually tapped and held up double green, double black 
so I could buff the Death Dealer once here and still have the regeneration mana up for it. But you can see me constantly thinking here, and that's just playing around the instant speed removal for Death Dealer. I'm like, would they really have kill shot and another instant speed removal spell? And I'm sitting here like, it's likely enough that I don't think I buffed the Death Dealer. So now we get to play a planes, hold up a kill shot, and a Death Dealer regenerate. I could also Dutiful Return right now, but I wouldn't have the mana to play anything I pick up this turn anyway. So I decide to just go kill shot and regenerate mana. Opponent declares no attacks. We top deck a Mardu Hate Blade. And now we've got no good attacks on board, so it is dutiful return time. And here is a spicy one. Because I have two morph cards in my grave, I'm like, well, I could pick up Master Pearls and the Teamer Charger. That way, if I morph a creature this turn, they have no way to know if it's the Master of Pearls or not. And the great thing about Master of Pearls is, like, I can play it and flip it in the same turn, even if it isn't attacking. So this allows me to play a Morph and hold up a Kill Shot this turn. Or not a Kill Shot, a uh, Regenerate on the Death Dealer, I guess either way. We get to play a Morph, hold up Regenerate for Death Dealer, and pass. And the Morph that we play doesn't even have to be Master of Pearls, because I'll have just as many creatures on board if I play the Teamer Charger this turn, or if I play the Master of Pearls this turn. So I might as well play the Teamer Charger and then next turn play and flip the Master of Pearls. That way if they have any removal in hand, we might pull it out because they might try to kill what they think could be the Master of Pearls. So little, little spicy, little cheeky kind of morph play here. Because either way, I just want a 3-drop creature to go with my Hate Blade, because I want a creature that costs 3 to go with my 1-mana creature so I can hold up the regeneration while I do it. And there they go, they Murderous Cut the Morph. It's just a 3-1 Teamer Charger. They now know we have a Master of Pearls in hand to cast and flip in the same turn, and they concede the game. That is now 6-2 and two after the 1-2 and two start. And you might... You probably realized earlier why I'm doing this post commentary thing and why this is the video that's getting uploaded because it's pretty awkward. I don't usually like to do this. I don't normally like to do post commentary in the first place, but especially like swapping out halfway through a video. But uh, yeah, I was convinced it was over, stopped commentating altogether so that I could just record the next run, but I kept playing. Because you know me, I gotta get maximum value. I gotta at least fight for some gems or something, even if I don't make a video out of the event. So, here we are, now in the final battle, in a run that I was so convinced was over that I just stopped commentating altogether. And we'll see how it all wraps up. Start with that turn one hate blade against a blue red deck. And this hand had some beautiful mana, natural Abzan, white, green, and black. And then they drop a Tusk Guard Captain here. Turn three, which is pretty spooky. Uh, I was looking up instants that cost two or less in this set, because it was holding for them when they had two mana. It could be Force Away to bounce a creature, or this big X mana Icy Breath thing that taps everybody. <laughs> me thinking. Um, so I'm just playing as if they have Force Away here for the most part. As you can see, like me spreading out counters and stuff like that. Force Away is two mana to bounce a creature back to my hand. So if you see any weird lines coming up, it's because I'm trying to play around them bouncing a creature to my hand. Because I imagine if they have the thing that taps my whole board and stuns them, I'd probably just lose to that regardless. So yeah, like putting a plus one plus one counter on a one one death toucher doesn't change things too much, but it lets me hit for one more point of damage this turn and makes it so I'm not just all in on the armament core if they bounce that, still have a slightly bigger board. And that'll make it so if they bounce the armament core, I get to recast it and I've gotten three counters out of it instead of two since I get another enter the battlefield trigger, which is pretty cute. So our opponent goes into the think tank here, goes for the incremental growth for huge damage, and I imagine if they're doing this, they have some follow through for big damage. So I take the trade, 5-5 five, five for their 5-5, five, five. especially with the dutiful return in hand, we want to have two creatures in our grave at some point, pick them both up here. 
So now I think they're trying to outrace me, which leaves me a little scared, which is why I think so hard he here about maybe holding up the kill shot. But I do go for the scavenger. Keep putting her own threats on this board. They send in with the captain, and we go down to 10. And then they drop an Alpine Grizzly. They've got a 4-2 and a 5-6 out there. We're super dead to pump spells and stuff. We actually have perfect mana to cast Dutiful Return and hold up Kill Shot. But if we cast the Dutiful Return, we're only picking up one creature. So I've got a really hard choice because you know how greedy I am where I'm like, I want to hold till we have two creatures. But it's also probably good to be mana efficient and actually use this four mana right now. But I decide to hold it. I feel like with a kill shot on the 5-6 Trampler, we probably have the time to uh, to pick up a card with the Dutiful Return. And they do go ahead and Arc Trail the Hate Blade. So now we kill shot the Trampler and we can pick up two creatures with the Dutiful Return. So go to combat, send in for three. Dutiful Return, our two creatures in Grave. And we have the mana to cast two Hate Blades here for more blockers just in case they have a combat trick they're going to try to kill us with like become immense for plus six plus six so if they kill one of our blockers we can still block the grizzly with the other one but here it is we see what their two mana value or less spell was and it's the icy blast which is really bad here means if they have removal for this armament core we're dead but we top deck our own removal so now removal spells won't save them but i am at this point, I'm going to be completely honest, I was completely in fear of active trees, and I'm like, they're just going to have active trees in, and it's going to be over, but they top-decked, and they didn't have the active trees in, and there you go. What you all could have guessed already, for sure, is that I turned the 1-2 into the 7-2 in the run where I stopped commentating, so I had to go back <laughs> and post-commentate it. Because, uh, yeah, that is the one Arena Open day one run. I was very confident this was not the run. We started one and two. I'd have to win six games in a row. I thought this deck was good, but I didn't think it was that good. And I didn't think things were starting too well for us. And uh, we just turned it around. We got six wins in a row in the end. And the joke's on me. <laughs> I had to spend an extra, an extra hour today because I had to edit this little part out and then record over it. Now I got to edit it back in. So jokes on me in the end, but my apologies for the post commentary. But I think the person who's the most disappointed that I had to do post commentary is myself. <laughs> it's, it's really a, a never concede, never give up kind of day, which is kind of cute in the end. Uh, if I fully gave up and just resigned the event, who knows if I'd even make the arena open day two, because you never know the quality of sealed pool we would have gotten on future runs. And this deck was pretty good. It just started really rocky. And I think part of that was going for the blue splash in the start. I think that it was right. The, the final version of this deck where I cut the blue out and just put the salt eye scavengers back in. But uh, it's kind of hilarious because I went for a pun without really knowing what exactly I was referring to by titling the deck Cons of Tarkir. But it turns out the cons, the con artists this time around are the Karu Lich Lords. They tried to drag us down with them, but we went full Abzan in the end and uh, just went all in on Rakshasa, Death Dealer, and Master of Pearls, the better rares. And we drew, I'm going to be honest, we drew incredible <laughs> after those first few games, which was a big, big part in, uh, in helping secure the victory here. We hit Master of Pearls all the time, and we hit Rakshasa, Death Dealer, all the time and yeah unlikely things happen like drawing like an absolute champion and winning the event that you weren't planning on winning never concede everybody never concede never get up very glad i didn't resign the run even if i did resign commentating the run at that point yeah i guess uh We'll be seeing you in the Arena Open Day 2 draft number 1 at the very least. But for now, that's going to end today's video. 
As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.